All right, good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to say a quick hello to all the attendees, um, everyone that's joined in for this meeting. Um, we're going, I assume that there still will be a number of people joining us. Um, just wanted to let everyone know um, that we'll be starting in a few minutes. Uh, and I'd like to introduce Jennifer Taylor, um, who's a member of our board, and uh, she'll be leading the Project Pathway uh, update tonight for everyone. Uh, Jennifer, if there's anything you'd like to say to introduce yourself, um, and then we can get going in a few minutes when everyone else has uh, joined in. Thanks, Ben. Uh, welcome everyone, and thanks very much for participating in tonight's webinar. Uh, as Ben said, I'm Jennifer Taylor, and I'm the Field Hockey BC Athlete Program Director. I'm also the lead for the project that we're going to be presenting on this evening. Um, ben is going to assist me with the presentation. And we also have several Field Hockey BC staff and board members who are um, participating tonight. And they're going to be available to answer questions um, throughout the presentation. We may also have some project team members that are in attendance as well. I see a few of you on the uh, attendees list, so that's great. Um, I'd like to start just by letting you know this is the first webinar of two for the Provincial Athlete uh, Pathway Review Project. Tonight we're going to be talking to you to give you an update on what the team has been working on so far. And the second webinar, which we're going to hold in about eight weeks, is going to present to you the draft recommendations uh, of the working group. So you probably have noticed that the webinar or the presentation is in a webinar mode and we're doing that just so everyone can hear the presentation and there'll be no disruptions. We will have uh, a couple of points throughout the presentation where we're gonna stop and uh, ask, see if there's any questions. We'd like to ask you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you have any questions. And then uh, when we break, then we'll take a look at and see if there are any, and we'll figure out who the best person is to answer those questions. We'll also uh, have an opportunity at the end of the presentation if anyone has any other questions, final questions at the end. And we are recording this webinar, so uh, if you've missed it or you would uh, like to watch it again, it's going to be posted uh, to Field Hockey BC's YouTube channel. So I think that's all the sort of introductory points I wanted to make, so I think we can uh, begin the presentation. So Ben, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thanks, Ben. So this is the agenda for this evening. Uh, we're gonna cover six main topic areas. I'm gonna start out first by introducing the Provincial Pathway Working Group. And then I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about the project scope. And then we're gonna go into some detail around phase one of the project to let you know what the team has been working on over the past 11 weeks. Um, we'll chat with you a bit around some cross-jurisdictional research that we have been doing to help inform our discussions. And then we're going to go into a fairly detailed presentation on the feedback that we, we received from the clubs in response to our club uh, questionnaire. And then we'll, we'll finish off with uh, a description of what's happening in phase two of the project in terms of the recommendations that are going to be put forward to the Board of Directors and what the next steps will be after tonight. So that's the agenda for this evening. Before we dive in any further though, we wanted to uh, ask you a couple of questions to get a sense of who our audience is. So we have two, two very simple polls that we'd like you to participate in. And Ben, if you could bring up the first question. So this just gives us a sense of uh, the demographics in, on the audience. So we're asking you to pick one of the following uh, roles. It's the principal role that you play within the field hockey community. And I can see people are already picking uh, an option now. 
So we'll give you about 10 seconds to figure out which one appeals to you the most or speaks to you the most, and then we'll end the polling and we'll get a chance to see who our audience is. Okay, I think that's, that's all the polling that's in. I don't see anyone else responding. So Ben, could you end the polling please? And we'll take a look. Okay, so it looks like we have quite a few club representatives attending this evening, which is great. And several parents, uh, coaches, athletes, and some PSO reps as well. So we don't have anyone from the NSO. So that's great. Okay, thank you very much. So if we could just bring up the next question. So this one is asking, I'll just get Ben to bring up the next one. What area of field hockey are you primarily involved in? So just again, pick one. We'll give you about 10 seconds to tell us what area. You may be involved in more than one, but we just like you to pick the one that you are most or primarily involved in. Okay, we still have a few people putting their responses in. Okay, that's great. Looks like activity stopped. So Ben, could you, thank you. So here we have junior girls is the largest category, which makes sense. Junior boys and girls, second largest, and adult women, third largest. Okay, that's awesome. Thank you very much, everyone. That's great. That gives us a sense of who, who's attending tonight. So now we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so here we wanted to share with you uh, just a little bit about the members of our Provincial Pathway uh, Working Group. So these are the volunteers that have been spending one to two hours a week working on our projects since mid-April. Um, it's an awesome group. You probably know several of these people um, in your field hockey uh, careers or lives. So uh, you can see from the names that we have a tremendous amount of experience and, and expertise, um, both in program delivery as, as well in the role of governance. We have representation right across the province, uh, equal mix of genders. We also have representation from current and past national and next-gen athletes, uh, several current past field hockey BC and field hockey Canada coaches. We have a youth sport coach, we have a university athletic director, and we also have representatives from small, medium, and large clubs. We have a very good mix of uh, representation from both male and female programming. And you can see that we also have some Phil Hockey BC staff members that are supporting the project. So John Sacre, who is our um, head provincial coach, Krista Thompson, who's the regional lead coach for the island, and Donna Cumming is our athlete program manager. Not on this team, but who's playing a bigger and bigger role is Ben Harvey, who's assisting me tonight in the presentation. And you will know him as Field Hockey BC's Sport Development Manager. So this is the team. They've been working very hard and volunteering their time. And, and we're very grateful that they have stepped up and, and contributed to this process. So we'll go to the next slide, Ben. Thank you. So this slide talks a little bit about the project scope. Um, we wanted just to highlight a few, a few pieces for you. Uh, you can find the full project charter on the Field Hockey BC website. We have a page dedicated to this project. We just wanted to give you just a quick overview of some of the key pieces of the scope that the team is working with. 
the areas of focus are, are listed there. Um, we've been looking at past outcomes and issues to try and identify the gaps in the pathway and the gaps in our programming. Uh, we've also tried to identify some uh, lessons learned, things that in the past maybe haven't gone on so well. Um, so these areas of focus we've been looking at to examine our past performance, but they're also being uh, examined in terms of what the future athlete pathway and program model should look like. Uh, the other piece I wanted just to mention is that the working group is an advisory body only. They're, they do not have any decision-making capacity. Next slide, please, Ben. So this just gives a little bit more detail around the project scope. So you can see um, clubs are identified here. They're a very, very important part of our review. And the working group has spent considerable time uh, discussing the role that clubs play and reviewing the feedback that was provided through the club feedback questionnaire. Uh, Phil Hockey Canada is another important uh, organization to our review. Uh, we've met with them twice since the launch of the project. Uh, the first time was to obtain feedback from Philaki Canada regarding our review, and then the second time was for us to provide feedback for Philaki Canada's high performance review. So that's in scope. Uh, out of scope is the coaching pathway, the umpiring uh, pathway, uh, and the organizational structure and governance of the Society of Field Hockey BC. So those are not included uh, in our pathways. We do touch on coaching quite a bit in our discussions, um, but they are not included in the scope of this project. Next slide, please, Ben. So this, uh, this slide gives us details on what we're calling phase one of this project. So we've divided the project into two different phases. And the first phase is really focused on providing uh, a significant amount of information to the working group members uh, in order that everybody has a very solid understanding of the current pathway and programming, the current issues with regards to our program delivery model um, so that when we get into phase two and we start talking about potential uh, changes or solutions that everybody has a really solid understanding of the current environment and current system. So now I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about what we've done to date and um, we, we started out looking at the past. We shared um, some key documents with the working group, the current pathway, um, information with regards to the history of our programming, how it got started. We looked at some of the recent results. Uh, we um, shared with the members the um, minutes from the AGM, the motions that were put forward that impact uh, our project. Uh, and then we moved into talking about the gold medal profile. So our uh, head provincial coach, John Sacre, gave an overview presentation on uh, what the gold medal profile is. Several of our members were very familiar with it already because we've been using it in our regional program this year, but some of our members uh, weren't as familiar. So John provided an overview and um, and so uh, that was just to give a, a baseline understanding of what the tool is, uh, what the matrix is used for, what are the, the KPIs that our coaches are using uh, to um, use as objective criteria for uh, baseline comparison of athletes. So then we moved from there on to a presentation uh, that Donna gave the working group on targeted athletes and uh, the criteria that we use to nominate athletes, uh, including our own sport-specific criteria, as well as the criteria that we get from the Canadian Sport Institute. And we also shared with the working group information on the benefits and services that our targeted athletes receive. Mark Saunders, our executive director, provided the working group with a presentation on uh, the society's performance stream athlete funding. So uh, this information was uh, provided so that the working group could have a basic understanding of 
how our athlete programs are funded. And uh, we also provided a budget template for both the regional program as well as the provincial program so the working group members could see the different cost categories that were involved as well as get a sense of how we budget for our programming and how much it costs to run uh, the society's uh, direct athlete programming. We also provided uh, uh, copies of the financial statements for the society, the most recent audited financial statements. And um, this was just to give them an overview and a sense of the funding model and how we, how we budget and plan for our programming from a financial perspective. Yeah, it's important that uh, everyone understands the working group is not going to be required to submit a detailed budget that goes along with their recommendations, nor any kind of operational plan. Um, but we just really wanted them to have a, a general sense at a higher level of how the funding works and, and how the programs uh, are budgeted. Then after that, we went on and we had a, a guest speaker, David Hill, who's a director of systems excellence for the Canadian Sport Institute. He gave a presentation to the working group on the BC high performance system structure. He talked to the working group about the enhanced excellence funding and where Field Hockey B fits in. So he shared the assessment of our uh, funding model through that program. And then we had a discussion uh, on collaboration and opportunities for alignment between clubs, the PSO, the NSO, and the Next Gen. So it was a good opportunity for the working group to hear from David. He has a lot of experience and he works with many different sports. And so he was able to share his experience and to talk about some of the best practices that, that he's seen um, in other areas. Then we went on to have our dual meetings with Field Hockey Canada. So uh, initially we met with them to get their uh, feedback or their, um, to answer a series of questions that we presented to them. Uh, we had Susan Ahrens, the CEO of Field Hockey Canada attend our meeting, uh, Hugh Purvis, who's the next gen director of the men's national program, and Patrick Kishani, who's the next gen director of the women's national program. So we sent them a list of questions ahead of time and they came and they provided their answers. And then uh, I think it was either that week or the following week, um, we attended a meeting with Marcus Weiss, who's the consultant conducting the high performance review for Field Hockey Canada. And uh, they asked our working group a series of questions to assist with their high performance review. So that was, that was a great opportunity and I think that the working group members enjoyed listening to Marcus and hearing how things uh, work in Germany and getting his perspective on uh, the Canadian model and uh, at least some initial thoughts on things that he sees from his perspective. We've also conducted some cross-jurisdictional research. So uh, we have a project management team, uh, which is like a subgroup of the project. Uh, John, myself, Krista, and Donna. Uh, we meet every week to plan the meetings and we've also been meeting with other PSOs from other sports to talk to them about their pathway, their program model, um, the relationship with their NSOs, and uh, see if there's any um, key learnings that we can take away that will help us with our, with our um, review. We met with basketball BC, we met with uh, BC Rugby, and we've also met with Field Hockey Ontario. Uh, it, was, it was very interesting, very valuable, and we've shared all of that feedback with the working groups so that they'll be able to um, use that information and consider that information going forward. And then the last piece in phase one that we looked at was the feedback with regards to the club feedback questionnaire. So uh, I'm going to be talking about that um, quite a bit uh, after this section. So I'm not going to go into detail right now on that, but we shared all the feedback with the working group members, all the individual responses that we got from the clubs, uh, identified key trends uh, uh, between clubs, between regions, and we had a, a meeting dedicated to discussing that feedback um, and looking at what the clubs uh, had to say. 
So I'm going to stop there uh, and break for questions. Uh, so if anyone has any questions, again, can you please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen? And I'll just ask Ben now if there's any questions that have been submitted so far. Uh, there's none in there yet, Jennifer. Okay, good. Okay, so if there's no questions, then let's keep keep on continuing. Could you go to the next slide, please, Ben? Okay, so um, this, uh, this slide basically gives an outline of what the next 10 slides are going to talk about. So um, we are going to share with you the response that we got from the clubs in regards to the questionnaire that we sent out. So uh, we're, we're going to tell you a bit about the response that we received, how many clubs, what regions they're from, uh, what kind of um, representation they have with regards to youth, uh, youth athletes. We'll also share with you the feedback that they gave us around club-based performance programming, uh, who's doing it, who's planning on doing it, who can do it without any help, who needs help. And then we'll talk a bit about the regional program feedback. We've identified some key trends that uh, the clubs provided to us. Same with the provincial program, the key trends there. We're going to talk a little bit about how the clubs view consistency in programming, both from a, uh, a regional perspective as well as from a gender perspective. And then finally, we're going to share with you what the clubs said were the most important outcomes of this review. We can go to the next slide. Okay, so this slide basically is a pie chart and this is showing the club response by region. So this is, um, this is for the province as a whole. So the first thing you can see is at the very top, we had 19 clubs respond to the questionnaire out of a total of 37. And we're basing this on the January 2020 data. So uh, the data that was taken at the time that the AGM was held. So we can see that in the Southeast region, we had eight clubs respond, the island six, Northwest five, in the interior, there is only one club, and unfortunately, they did not submit a response. Uh, so what we did for the interior is we edited the questionnaire to take out the questions asking about the club programming. And we sent it to all the families of athletes that have participated in our program this last year, and we received two responses. So those responses have been incorporated into the results that you'll see today. Next slide. So this is the same uh, data, but it's just presented slightly differently. So uh, we wanted to share with you what the club responses were within the regions. So you can see that for the Northwest region, uh, there are 10 clubs, five responded and five didn't, so a 50% response rate. Same response rate we got in the southeast region, eight clubs responded, eight didn't. But on the island, we had a higher response rate, so we had six clubs that responded versus four that did not. Okay, next slide. So this club tells us the number of junior members that were represented by the club responses. So what we did here is we defined a junior member as being between the ages of 13 to 18 based on the January 31st, 2020 registration numbers. So of the 1,500 juniors that were registered at that time, uh, we have uh, 1,357 were represented by the clubs that responded to the survey. So 91% of eight juniors that age were included in the, in the response. Um, the interior um, response, again, is from two families, not from the clubs. So this pie chart, it just breaks out uh, the response by region. So you can see that on a provincial level, we have 53% uh, from the Northwest, so 793 juniors. The Southeast, 341, 23. 
uh, for the island, 223, 15%, and then two responses for um, the interior. So that left 9% or 141 juniors age 13 to 18 who were not represented in the responses that we received from the clubs. Okay, next slide. So this is the same data, it's just looking at it within the region. So you can see here that for the Northwest region, we had uh, a very high uh, representation of junior athletes, 99%. The Southeast, 83%, the island, 87%, and then in the interior, 7%. So this just gives you a sense of the same data, but within the region as opposed to for the whole province. Okay, next slide. This slide is presenting the feedback we received with regards to club-based performance programming. So we're looking again on a provincial level, so province-wide. So you have the three bar graphs there. The first one is showing how many clubs told us that they currently offer club-based performance programming. The center uh, um, chart shows us how many plan to, and then the third one shows us who has the capacity and capability to deliver it. So you can see that five out of 19 clubs currently offer, seven plan to offer, and six have the capacity and capability to deliver it without requiring any additional support. Um, on the flip side, it's showing that 74% of clubs uh, that responded don't offer any performance-based uh, club programming. 63% don't have any plans to, and 68% of clubs don't have the capacity or the capability to offer performance club-based programming. Next slide, please. So same data, again, by region. This just gives you a sense of the difference between the regions. You can see the Northwest, 60% of the clubs that responded currently offer performance programming, 60% plan to, and those same clubs don't require any support. They have all the capacity and capability needed to run it themselves. In the Southeast region, 25% of the clubs currently offer programming, but 50% plan to in the future. However, only 38% of clubs in the Southeast region felt that they had the capacity and capability to offer it. And the island you can see is 0% for all three areas. So there are no clubs on the island that currently offer any kind of club-based performance programming, have plans to, and, and that there are no clubs that have the capacity to, to deliver it. Next slide, please. So this slide tells us uh, the top three skills and resources that clubs felt they needed in order to offer club-based performance programming. And so what we've done is we've separated it out by region, but there definitely are some uh, trends across the regions. So you can see that uh, coach education or coaching resources were identified as one of the top three needs in all regions of the province. The interior is not represented again because we had no club respond. So this is just the three regions there. And access to water-based turf was identified uh, in two regions as uh, a needed resource. Next slide, please. So this is just a summary of what we just showed you. 37% of clubs have plans to offer club-based performance programming. 32% have the capacity and capability to do so. The Northwest region has the strongest capability and capacity. The Southeast region, 50% of clubs plan to offer it, but only 38% have the capacity and capability and there's no islands, uh, no clubs in the island region that deliver performance programming. Okay, next slide, please. 
So this slide is presenting to you the, cre the key trends that were identified through the club uh, questionnaire with regards to the regional program. And you can see that um, there was overwhelming support for, for Field Hockey BC to continue to offer the regional program, either in its current form or in a modified way. So I think out of the 19 clubs that responded, there were two clubs that uh, indicated they did not want the regional program to continue, but there were 17 clubs that indicated that they wanted it to be offered either the way it is now or in a modified format. Many clubs identified the need to eliminate scheduling conflicts between the regional program and spring league ho hockey. Uh, many clubs also identified they'd like to see Field Hockey BC provide more leadership, direction, and support for clubs by setting standards for training uh, and for coaching, and also for um, uh, the PSO to conduct monitoring of club-based programming to ensure that those standards are being maintained on a consistent basis. Several clubs said that they would like Field Hockey BC to establish clear and transparent athlete uh, evaluation and team selection criteria and processes, and they would like us to use a skills matrix or key performance indicators, which we spoke about earlier. Many clubs would like Field Hockey BC to work more closely with club coaches to identify talent and to use league play as a talent source. Many clubs would like uh, regional trials eliminated and the fitness requirement as a way to encourage more athletes to participate in the sport. Uh, but they recognize, many clubs recognize that if it's opened up uh, in that way that it will require uh, the tiering of athletes within the program by skill level in order to create the best training environment for those athletes. It wasn't unanimous. Not all clubs wish this to be, uh, this change to happen, but there were uh, definitely a majority that, that would like to see this change. Greater club PSO communication and engagement to increase membership knowledge and understanding of the pathway and the programs that Field Hockey BC runs, including with adult only clubs. So we had a number of adult clubs, even though they don't have juniors, they would like to understand the programming that we offer to junior athletes, uh, just so they're aware. Um, so there's a, a, you know, an interest in engagement there, not just with juniors, or clubs representing junior athletes, but adult athletes as well. Reducing the cost of the regional program was a, a trend that was identified uh, strongest in the Southeast region, fair bit of support from the island as well. And then lastly, uh, a number of clubs would like to see Field Hockey BC diversify the training locations and provide a simplified uh, or modified regional program in areas with less resources. So those are the key trends that were identified for the regional program. And if you could turn the page, Ben, the next slide will look at the key trends that were identified for the provincial program. You'll see, you'll notice that a lot of these actually are the same. So I don't want to repeat them, um, but uh, I, can, I can share with you that 100% uh, of the clubs indicated they wanted Field Hockey BC to continue with the provincial program, uh, either in its current form or in a modified way. Scheduling conflicts uh, was also identified. Eliminating the requirement for participation in Field Hockey BC's regional program to be eligible for selection to Team BC, so that was identified by several clubs. We know um, a motion that was passed at the AGM in February um, uh, supported that decision. So that's something that the working group um, is aware of, that the pathway will be opening up. So that's, that's an understood piece. Um, PSO established clear and transparent athlete evaluation and team selection criteria. Again, that's the same as for the regional program and working more closely with club coaches to identify talent and use leads as a talent source greater communication, reducing the cost, 
uh, increasing competitive opportunities, including international tours. So this, this piece is a little different. This feedback is a little bit different. So a number of clubs felt that uh, Field Hockey BC should be providing uh, more competitive opportunities for our top, top athletes um, in addition to or other than the national championships. Um, so a few clubs had suggested that we take our top provincial teams on international tour and, and provide them with a more challenging, more competitive experience. A number of clubs suggested that Phil Lucky BC consider running the provincial program on an annual cycle in a camp-based format. And there was also support for incorporating education, training, mentorship, and community building into the national championships for coaches, officials, and sport administrators. Oh, you beat me to it. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> so this slide is talking about consistency with regards to performance programming. So we asked our clubs to let us know what they thought about consistency across regions as well as uh, between genders, male, female. And what we heard is that clubs are fine allowing some regional flexibility. In fact, it's seen as necessary. Each regions are unique. There's even um, areas within regions that have different needs and, and different strengths. So clubs were fine if we needed to um, incorporate some regional flexibility in our programming delivery, but there were certain elements that clubs felt needed to have some consistency across regions. And these were the elements that were suggested that should be uh, consistent. Training hours, skills matrix, athlete evaluations, coaching qualifications, and program costs. When it comes to gender, so again, uh, support for flexibility. In fact, I would say there was uh, significant support for um, using a different approach for male programming, uh, allowing considerations uh, for male programming that takes into account the fact that we have fewer numbers and also that a lot of our athletes are, male athletes are multi-sport athletes and field hockey is competing with other sports like soccer and basketball and rugby. So we need to, we need to um, consider those, those factors when we're developing our programming. Male athletes also have fewer competitive opportunities. So that's something else that needs to be factored into any program decisions. Uh, but clubs did not want female programming uh, to be sacrificed or changed in any way to accommodate the male programming. And then the next slide, Ben, this is the last slide on the results of the club feedback questionnaire. So these are the most important outcomes that were identified by the club. So cross club, cross region. Uh, and these are in order of priority. So this was uh, identified by the most clubs of all the, the items that I'm going to present to you on this slide. Develop complementary programming between the club and the PSO with fewer scheduling uh, conflicts. So next one. So PSO continues to offer the regional program in a consistent way and makes it accessible to any interested athlete. So again, that speaks to what I talked about earlier opening the regional program up, not holding trials, not having uh, an entry level fitness standard, but making the regional program more accessible and offering it in areas that we currently don't offer it. Next point, eliminate the requirement for uh, participation in our regional program for selection to Team BC. Not a lot of clubs actually commented on that, but I think that was because it was a motion that was passed at the AGM. And so we're going forward with the understanding that that's happening. So clubs may not have felt the need to include that in their response. Next one, so develop a clear and transparent athlete evaluation process using clearly defined key performance indicators and with player feedback provided to all individual athletes. So there's definitely, um, uh, sort of a, an interest in having the evaluation process transparent. I think clubs, families, athletes would like to have more information about what it is. They'd like to see um, objective criteria such as KPIs or gold medal profile used. 
and they would like athletes to receive feedback on those evaluations so they can identify the areas that they uh, need to improve on in order to advance further along the pathway. Next one, grow the sport. So a lot of clubs would like this review to grow the sport. Next one, reduce the cost of PSO programming. Next, better communication between all stakeholders. Next. Align the PSO NSO pathway. So a number of clubs uh, identified that there needs to be better alignment between the PSO and the NSO. And next, greater PSO support for and oversight of club-based programming by establishing province-wide consistent training and coaching standards and developing consistent athlete tracking and reporting tools for clubs and the PSO to use. So. Um, that, that piece is really looking at Field Hockey BC, developing those training and coaching standards, the athlete tracking tools, and many clubs would like to see those expanded um, down to the club level so that the clubs will be able to use, um, use the same uh, or similar or modified criteria so that we have consistency between the club and the PSO level. So that's the end of the slides on the club uh, feedback questionnaire responses. So what we'll do now is we'll take another break and I'll ask Ben if there are any questions. Uh, yep, we've got a few. Um, one from Denise, can you remind us uh, what general municipalities align with the lower mainland regions, please? So the Northwest, Southeast, those sort of things. Okay, um, well, I know, but I'm probably, I, I'm going to ask Mark Saunders to answer that question because he knows it like the back of his hands. So Mark, can you help us out here? Yeah, absolutely. So the, we have two regions on the island. Firstly, we have uh, uh, Southern Island, which is Victoria-based, uh, and Mid-Island, which is uh, Duncan-based, Cowichan-based. Uh, we have the Northwest, um, which is Vancouver and the North Shore. Uh, we have the Southeast, which is um, Surrey. Uh, and, fur and further afield through, uh, through the Fraser Valley. And then we have the interior, which is centralized in Kelowna. All right, um, another question came in from Maya. Um, is there any chance of FHBC taking part in future BC under 16 summer games? I am going to let Mark answer that again. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. In in short, if BC Games fits in uh, to the athlete pathway, is deemed a meaningful part of the athlete pathway, and most importantly, it uh, qualifies uh, or field hockey BC qualifies in the minimum eligibility for that uh, because there are minimum eligibility requirements by region, uh, and as we know, field hockey doesn't necessarily qualify in all of those regions. Uh, then there's no reason why why not. Uh, next sorry, question sorry, came ben. in. Sorry, Ben, just before you go on. So I, I just would like to add that I, I did go on to the BC Summer Games website recently, and there is a notice there that they are not allowing any new sports to enter. Um, I think that there's issues or concerns with the large number of sports that they already have. So... Um, so Mark, sorry, you wanted to add something there to that? No, I, I think it's, it's, they'll accept applications. Um, so if we do find that, um, that we feel that it's, an, that it's an important part of the athlete pathway and we do qualify for eligibility, then we would naturally make the application and then it would be based on, um, on, on room. Um, but that's more often who's hosting. Uh, and what facilities are, are, are available. So it might be that if, that if the hosting opportunity is in a geographical location um, that is uh, able, to be uh, able to provide the necessary facilities for, for field hockey, um, that we would be potentially included uh, uh, under those circumstances. Thanks, Mark. I like your answer better than mine. Uh, next one comes from Anonymous. Um, were the clubs supposed to provide feedback based on input from parents or strictly what the club managers felt in relation to the survey, I think? 
So I, I can answer that question. So we sent the questionnaire to the all the club presidents in British Columbia. Um, and, but we also notified all the membership uh, that we were uh, conducting this questionnaire or this survey. Um, we left it up to each club to decide how they wanted to respond uh, and whatever process they felt was appropriate uh, for their club. So we didn't have any guidelines or any rules around that. We, just, we simply left it up to each club to decide how they wanted to uh, gather the information and submit their response. Uh, also in relation to the survey from Penny, um, were Polar Bears and Rob Short Academy invited to contribute to the review as clubs or separately or not at all? Did they contribute? So I can answer that question. Um, so Polar Bears are a club. And so they were included, uh, they were sent a questionnaire to complete. Uh, the Rob Short Academy, my understanding is that they are not a, a club, registered club, and so they were not sent a questionnaire. Uh, from Alex, do the junior numbers represent those who were registered in January 2020? If so, this is very non-representative of uh, is very non-representative as most juniors for spring season would not yet have been registered as FHBC members. So were the junior numbers uh, those who were registered as of January 2020 or were the numbers taken from some other time? So the numbers were taken from January 2020 and Alex you're right uh, if an athlete is only playing spring league they may not have registered at that time uh, but many of our athletes do play uh, year-round. So um, if they were involved in field hockey BC programming or if they were playing in the men's league or the women's league, then they would have been included in those numbers. However, this wasn't a, a member's survey. This was a survey that was sent to the clubs and the clubs were responsible for submitting a response. So. Um, Mark, did you want to add anything to that? I don't, I don't have the numbers, Jennifer, but um, uh, a lot of clubs did actually register a lot of athletes ahead of the, uh, ahead of the AGM. Uh, it, won't have, it won't obviously, as you state, have covered everybody. Um, but uh, yeah, at that point, um, we did go on the, uh, on the end of January registration numbers. Thank you, Mark. Uh, final question from Maya. How will athletes be chosen for Team BC? The answer is stay tuned. <laughs> so uh, we'll be having uh, another webinar in about eight weeks time. We're going to be presenting the draft recommendations from the working group. And uh, those recommendations will include information about uh, the proposed Team BC selection model. Uh, it hasn't been developed yet. That's phase two of our project, which I'm just about to go into. So that's a perfect segue into the next couple of slides. And we've got one other comment from Chris, um, who suggests that we should be looking at developing um, the number of people playing so that we can gain a more successful uh, performance program as the ultimate goal. And one from Jim Knight, um, the Victoria region's youth registration closed prior to the end of January. So these are representative and complete of the islands. Great, thank you, Chris and Jim. And that's everything that we've got up to now. Super, thanks, Ben. So we just have two more slides that we wanted to present to you. So we'll go on to uh, phase two. So uh, if you recall at the beginning of the presentation, I talked about how we split the project, project into two phases. The first phase was really about providing information uh, to the working group members. Well, phase two is about the working group members uh, starting to identify what the new pathway, athlete pathway and program model should look like. So these are the, the um, the elements or the key pieces that we're working on at the present time. 
we have completed some of these steps, but uh, they're not all finished. We started out by doing a priority needs exercise where we had each individual working group member identify their top three needs for athletes, for clubs, and for the PSO. And then we um, combined those together. We all uh, discussed them as a group. And then we did a voting exercise where uh, each working group member picked their top three within each of those three categories. So what we've done is we've identified what we feel as a working group are the top needs for athletes, clubs, and the PSO. And that is really meant to um, provide a background or a framework for the conversations that will happen subsequently to that. So that was the first step of phase two. Uh, from there, we moved on to a discussion about targeted athletes. Who are they? Who should they be? Um, what's the process to get identified as a targeted athlete? When should it happen? Um, how should it happen? So uh, those are sort of the questions that the working group uh, has discussed already, and we were able to come to consensus on a number of those key, key pieces. The next key element we discussed was the regional program. Again, uh, what should it look like? where should it be offered, uh, when, um, how should it be offered. So all, again, all those key pieces on the regional program uh, we've discussed. And then we did the same thing for the provincial program. That meeting was held last night. It was almost two hours long, but it was, it was a fantastic meeting and there's lots of great ideas and lots of suggestions. And we've been able to identify a number of common elements or pieces of, uh, uh, the program model and, and pathway that I think the working group members uh, agree on. So uh, those pieces uh, are done in draft anyway. Um, the next uh, couple of meetings, we're going to focus on club PSO NSO alignment. So we're going to present a draft pathway to the working group based on the discussions to date and the, the areas of consensus that we've been able to achieve so far. And then after that, we're going to look at stakeholder communication and engagement. So here what we're talking about is communicating and engaging with our stakeholders around the, the new athlete pathway program model. Um, and, then, and then also uh, for the PSO communication and engagement once the board decides what direction it wants to take and we have an implementation plan put forward uh, what kind of communication is, is important uh, for that to happen. So those are some of the key pieces that we have left to do. And then if you can just go to the last slide, Ben. This just gives you a little bit of information on next steps. So uh, what's going to happen in, by mid-July, we hope to complete a new proposed provincial athlete pathway and finalize the draft recommendations for review. We are going to be holding another webinar, which we hope that you'll come back and, and participate in. We're going to present those draft recommendations to our membership and the clubs in late July. We will also be presenting uh, those recommendations to the board, uh, hopefully in late July as well. And then after we gather the feedback from those two processes, will finalize the report and present it to the Field Hockey BC Board of Directors in early August. So those are the next steps on the project. And um, before we wrap up and say good night, I'll just ask Ben if there's any more questions that have been, or comments that have been put forward. Uh, nothing so far. Okay, great. So uh, just a reminder, there, this is being recorded. And so if you want to watch it again or you know anyone that missed it, it's going to be posted on Phil Lucky BC's uh, YouTube channel. And if anyone wants more information about the project, uh, you want to provide feedback or you have any questions, feel free to contact me. My email is on the Phil Lucky BC website. If you just look under contacts, uh, you'll see my name is the Athlete Program Director and my email is there and I'd be happy to chat with you. So on behalf of uh, the Field Hockey BC Board of Directors and all the staff and our working group, thank you very much for participating tonight. I hope you found the, the information uh, helpful. Good night, everyone.
Thank you, Jennifer, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, that ends it for here. Um, and just wanted to thank everyone that did put in comments and questions. Um, like Jennifer said, the video will be put up on YouTube, but there will also be a link added to our FHBC website just to make it a little bit easier to find. And we'll also likely put that link in some of our communications coming out to you in the future. Um, Andrea, you've just raised your hand. Um, can you write in the chat or put something in the questions for us instead of just raising your hand, if you have anything? Um, okay, seeing nothing coming through. Um, we'll finish it off there, guys. Again, thank you very much for attending. And if you do have any other information or any questions, please send it through to uh, the office or to Jennifer, and we'll be able to answer any of those questions that you may have. Um, and we'll finish it there. So thank you very much, and good night.